Rafos, uh, Ifpri, uh, well, to Channing and Manish, uh, very, uh, thanks for very interesting presentations and also for the optimism that you spread out. Now, uh, I was going to suggest that you, you need a subtitle um, to Faster Than You Think. Uh, I would say it's faster than you think, but not fast enough. And the question is, well, what needs to happen to make it faster? Um, to in the beginning, you mentioned this big number of almost $300 billion in investments in renewable energy. But uh, and you called it a big number, but I don't think that's such a big number. right? I think every year is more than $500 billion spent on energy subsidies, most for fossil fuels. The total sum of um, investments in energy, if I have the numbers right, is about $2 trillion globally. So that makes it about 15%. So to make the energy transition uh, that needs to take place um, to meet climate goals uh, and so on, things need to happen a lot more fast than then. So one thing is to think about these subsidies. Uh, what more can be done to put the price incentives right, not just on the side of reducing cost of renewable energy, but rising the cost of fossil fuels. That would be the other, and what, what would be the implications of that? But I guess also the other side of the coin is we need a lot more energy efficiency in order to make the <coughs> the, the whole switch to, to a new energy system. So are you still that optimistic after the counter numbers I gave you just here? Thank you, Rob. I saw another hand up right here. Will Martin from IFPRI, thanks very much. Wonderful presentations both. Um, one one uh, point, um, uh, Manish, uh, you didn't mention emissions from agriculture, you know, which are maybe a, an agriculture and land use, about a quarter uh, of the total. It adds to the, the challenge there and has very, very different characteristics, you know, very, very tightly concentrated in beef and dairy and things like that. Um, and then two, two sort of technical question-y comments. Channing, integrating with hydro seems like a terrific opportunity because that's a sector that can give you positive output of electricity and negative if, you, if you're reversing flows. So it uh, seems like a big opportunity. Then a question, my understanding is the move of the power network, the grid, is actually deeply challenged by the fact that the current one is so set up tops down, you know, high tension would, s would then step down to the consumer. Uh, if you start distributing it, um, you know, it's, it, it requires very big changes, I, I think. But uh, you didn't mention, I'm interested in, in that question. Thank you. Uh, there's one more question in the back here. Julie Kurtz from IFPRI. Um, Thank you for this presentation. I was wondering, uh, you were talking about the uh, demand and equal access to electricity. I was wondering about the um, the ownership of these power sources. And so thinking about some power sources, like hydro, like coal, maybe have more consolidated ownership. Is there, do you have a sense of um, which of renew which of the renewable resources or energy sources has more opportunity for more equitable ownership and so that it doesn't create or it doesn't have a, a tendency to create more disparity as it um, as it grows in in certain countries okay I think I'll turn it back over to the panel now Channing do you want to respond first okay so this is a good question um, you know, one of the issues is almost everything's going faster than you think. This is why we have a 1.5 degree report. And the, the main message of the 1.5 degree report, I mean, we didn't talk about 1.5 degrees five years ago or 10, you know, only a few people did. Um, you talked about two. Why is it that you're talking about 1.5 instead of two? And the reason is, if you look at, at almost every indicator of where, you know, where does sort of dangerous climate change begin, it begins at lower temperature rises than we thought so many so many years ago uh, and and this you can see in the report this doesn't this isn't a kind of a, a what we call climate sensitivity is the amount of warming that you get for uh, uh, a given amount of greenhouse gas emissions or a certain concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that's changed stayed relatively constant what you might call earth system sensitivity 
has gone up a lot. So the way that the, the way that we view the Earth reacting to temperature rises, especially the environmental systems, is they, they appear to they're much more sensitive than than we had thought. This is why there's just a lot less ice on on, on the North Pole than than we sort of forecasted 10, 15 um, uh, years ago. So it is true that that both paces are are happening, right? Um, I think that we can, uh, you know, relative to where we were 10 years ago, if you walked out of the COP 2009, like I did, and then you told me this is where we'd be today, I don't know if I'd have believed you. Uh, I don't think I would have. So I think that's part of the reason why. And I was looking at all this resistance in, in South Africa and all of these problems, and that has changed completely on its head. So instead of fighting the Energy Intensive Users Group, which big companies taking about 50 percent power demand, the Energy Intensive Users Group saying, well, we want wind and solar. It's cheaper. And in fact, if you don't provide it, we're going to leave the grid and we're just going to buy our own and use it our, ourselves. That's a different world, and it's a lot to work with, right? Uh, and, and so the, I think that, you know, we, we want to uh, deal with that and, yes, accelerate uh, uh, those, those transitions. Um, I'll, I'll touch on the others and then let yeah. you. Okay. Uh, emissions from agriculture. I, I, I've given a talk, and it's a different talk, and I think, but, but it's true. Uh, it's really interesting that why is it that we're getting all this publications on emissions from agriculture? I think it's because, you know, so many years ago, it was all about fossil fuels because that was, that was really where the action was, and agriculture is hard. Now, it's not like, as Manish says, it's not like we're out of the woods, but there's a way, there's a way to look forward towards a much, much lower emissions power sector, fossil fuel sector, transport sector, and so forth. What's left? It's agriculture. Agriculture emits about as much as, um, uh, as electricity generation. So it's, it's a very, very significant sector, and most of that is methane. Um, there's a, actually there's a really good publication just out of Oxford about methane and its properties. And uh, you know one of the key factors with methane is it only lasts in the atmosphere for 10 years or, or so. Whereas uh, 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 CO2 will stay there for, for potentially for, for centuries. So if we get emissions from, from methane down, then uh, you can get quite a, quite a bang for your buck. So that's another reason to look. And I think CO2 EQ was useful so many years ago when methane was relatively unimportant. But CO2 EQ is not helping us really think about this problem. At, at this point, we need, we need to think about it in a, in a different uh, kind of way. Uh, the last one, ownership of power sources. I think it's really interesting that um, sort of the variable renewables pushes in both directions in the sense of, you can have a little village mini grid system, and it's going to be, you know, it's a reasonably inexpensive way to, to generate electricity. It can somehow be locally owned. All of this, you know, kind of payment models and so forth um, are really important. I mean, you know, when we talk about the 800 million or 900 million people who don't have access to electricity, uh, you know, the, one of the issues is it's not enough just to give them electricity. What are they supposed to do with it? Shock themselves? You know, they, they, you know, they don't have anything to use uh, with this, for, use this power for. So we have to bring packages of support so that you can pump water, refrigerate things, make, make machines run, do processes, light your, uh, or else we just have small scale stuff, right? But that, that's one whole set of issues. It also makes things bigger, like I showed with those wind turbines and the fact that you want, uh, you want power generated for your big scale demands in cities, generated over large pieces of space and, and, and transmission. This, I think, for uh, one of the important points, especially for smaller countries geographically, is that in the new world, regional energy trade has always been a good idea. But now it's a much, much better idea. Uh, because you're going you're gonna to need it, or else you really, really have to overbuild a lot in order to get the reliability that you're gonna that you're gonna need. Uh, whereas if you could, if you're in Malawi, you can do it, but it's gonna be expensive. But if you're part of a really effective Southern African power pool, it's gonna be it's gonna be a lot better. Great, thank you. Um, 
So, so, so on, on the first question, it, it, it reminds me of this image of kind of a, a dog chasing a bus, right? We're, we're the dog, uh, kind of the renewables, kind of low carbon, clean energy. We're making some progress, but the bus seems to be going further and further ahead. Um, and, and, and I think to some extent, we, we need to think about how we actually change the way in which we catch the bus. Um, one, one of the, so you mentioned eliminating fossil fuel subsidies, get a better level playing field. That's one part of it. Um, thinking about carbon pricing, right? Carbon pricing, getting, getting, getting honest prices so you can actually have a level playing field when different energy sources are competing is a huge piece of the conversation. And carbon pricing is really picking up momentum. We now have 46 countries, 25 subnational jurisdictions that have or intend to put in place carbon pricing within by 2020. The biggest one, of course, is China, which will be rolling out something for the power sector and then extending it beyond the power sector in the coming years. It begins to help create the right incentives to do so. Another, another big push, air pollution. We all know the challenge of air pollution in many parts around the world, but particularly in developing Asia and soon to be developing Africa. When you actually, so, so a lot of the shifts towards more public transit, how you design cities, much less what kind of energy sources you actually generate or, or develop, um, air, clean air, is a big part of the motivation, right? Climate may be a co-benefit, but there's a lot of other things one can do that are good for ec economics, good for quality of life, with climate as a co-benefit that will also further accelerate this effort. But you're absolutely right to point, uh, to point out this challenge. I do think we see, um, since Paris, we, we are seeing more challenges politically in terms of clearly the leadership on climate globally is not where it was three years ago. I was in China last, year, uh, last week speaking with, uh, with their climate minister, with a number of their energy minister, about whether or not China would be willing to enhance or update their NDC, their national climate commitment, in advance of 2020. For those of you following the climate conversations, you know this is a pretty important moment to see if we can get greater ambition. And you take something like the trade tensions, concerns in China that the United States is going to shut off the oil, and it forces them to think about coal to oil. It forces them to think about where else are we going to be able to ensure energy security, and how ambitious do we want to be with our clean energy commitments internationally in this geopolitical moment? At a time when they're developing their 14th five-year plan and putting in the metrics for what success would look like. So there are, there are real geopolitical challenges, but there are some bright spots. Um, we're not where we need to be, so you, you are right in raising that. Um, quickly on, on ag. So ag is about direct and indirect. So methane, a big piece of it, but the other big piece of it is the indirect land use impacts on forests, 25% in total. We have a, a major piece of research that we've spent six years working on, our World Resources Report, that's going to be launched uh, in, in, in a few weeks um, that is exploring precisely this question in, in an extensive amount of detail. Um, but the basic kind of argument, as you uh, feel kind of odd saying this at IFPRI since you guys know this much better than I do. But um, we need to increase the number of calories, 60%, right, by 2050. Uh, we um, we uh, have to uh, yield productivity increases, have to be comparable, if not greater than the Green Revolution. And this all has to happen without any additional land expansion. How are we going to make that work, right? And a couple of things that come to our kind of mind, and we have a menu of solutions of what needs to be done. There's no silver bullet. We know that. But a big piece of it is kind of this produce and protect concept. How do you produce more food on the same land while protecting the forest frontier, right? And how do you get those systems in place to work um, in, in, some of the, in some of the more difficult geographies <coughs> around the world? So that's a big piece of it. Another big piece of it is how you rethink demand, right? So my father bought uh, Beyond Meat stock uh, shortly after it IPO'd, um, and, and, and he sold it a couple days later, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, there is kind of really interesting work also being done both around how you reduce food loss and waste as well as how you, uh, how you think about alternative proteins. Are there ways, when I was in China last week, as I mentioned, with a big kind of talk about how to have them think about innovation around alternative proteins as a way to have actually more secure supply chains for, 
uh, for plant-based meat products. Right? So kind of an interesting conversation there. The other challenge also with a agriculture and land use are the expectations that a lot of the climate models have for negative emissions, which I think are really problematic because I think they really don't fully take into account the constraints we have in terms of how much land there is for the multiple needs we have for that same piece of land. So lots of tough, difficult, but important questions there. I'll, I'll, I'll just say one word. Just I, I really like the question about the, um, the, the, the issue, the energy, the democratizing energy question. Um, I do think that it's both true at the asset level with renewables. You do have, re you know, take solar, uh, you know, rooftop PV as an example of ways in which you can perhaps democratize. But it's also not just at the asset level. It also could be potentially at the network level. Think of off-grid systems versus grid-connected systems as another way to think about how one can do that. But I do think more research, more thinking needs to go into these more distributed systems and how that perhaps um, rebalances how we look at power and how we look at poverty in many of these developing countries. It's, it's worth a longer discussion. Channing, do you want to add to that question on how institutional arrangements may evolve with these new kinds of VRE systems? Um, yeah, that's an area that we need to do uh, a bunch more work. I think um, one of the things that, you know, relative to, say, 2009 is, you know, the engineers have done a really good job, right? There's a lot there. Uh, we have a lot to work with. It's the policy <laughs> and the politics and the governance and the institutions. We don't know what to do. But that's what happens in this room. And so it's, it's now time in 2000, they, they've, the, the, the engineers have, have given us the tools to take this on in a much more effective way than we had 10 years ago. And now, if we're going to reach what Manish has done by dividing that paper, it's not a technical challenge so much anymore. There is, I mean, of course, and if, you know, there are technical things there. Um, we're going to get new, new technology, but the big piece is the institutional economics. And, and, and getting getting that right. Uh, so, so I think the, the burden is, is coming down, down to us, and it's up to us to figure out what are the, the best systems institutionally for dealing with. That, that was a question on my forward-thinking slide because I don't know. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to the online audience. Lucy, do we have any questions online? Hi, um, yes, uh, so this one is a question from Manish Bapna from Nafil from India. Can you please explain social cost, which you have mentioned in the slide? Does it have a positive or negative aspect? And the second one is Seal from Charles Derby University, Australia. How can we draw attention to the next among climate change, energy, food, and groundwater in research for policymakers and the public more generally? Um, so so on, I'll, I'll take the first question uh, and, and maybe pass the second one to Channing. Um, so so on, the, on the first question, uh, social costs. So, so basically, um, it, it kind of in fairly um, simple terms, uh, w the cost of a particular technology like coal may not necessarily capture uh, all of the uh, impacts that coal may have um, to society. So if coal contributes to air pollution or coal contributes to global warming, the cost of that air pollution in terms of the impact it may have on human health or the cost of uh, global warming in terms of the impact that may have on global welfare isn't necessarily quantified, much less monetized, into the cost of coal. So the concept of the social cost is trying to bring some of those externalities some of those external impacts and internalizing them so we can have a better basis in which to make decisions that can maximize social welfare or economic growth. So, I mean, sometimes I feel like we're, we're attacking 21st century problems with 20th century institutions we have, a, and, and that's kind of a, that's a problem. Uh, and I think that goes to, to the heart of that. And, and a lot of us are working, you know, try to deal with, with, that, with that issue or at least if not structurally, then, then work within it. Um, Manish and I are involved in this Global Commission on Adaptation, 
which I think is, is part of that, that effort. Um, so there's an effort that's uh, uh, led by um, Ban Ki-moon, um, the CEO, Kristalina Georgieva of the World Bank, and, uh, and Bill Gates to try to get more attention to, to adaptation um, and adaptation issues. Uh, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, contain warming uh, as, uh, you know, to the greatest degree that we, that we can, but we will do very well um, to hold this thing uh, within, you know, a, a half a degree, and we've already got one degree, right, over 150 years, so over 150 years, one, over the next 30, at least a half, uh, you know, maybe more, uh, and, and it's all going to happen at, at, a, at a rapid pace. Uh, you know, relative to to what we've what we've seen before, um, so there's um, going to be going to be quite a bit to do. But I think that uh, you know these institutional questions are are quite important, uh, both at the kind of the global level and at the country level. And I think that's why uh, it's it's repercuting back into into the, the the social social science sphere. And I would just add that there are new tools for sort of minimizing these trade-offs across the water energy food nexus, especially with reference to groundwater resources. So, I mean, we have a lot more information, you know, groundwater mapping, we know where these resources are. Um, we also have tools like monitoring devices that can be used in the field or monitoring flow rates of pumps and a lot of other tools for sort of um, increasing collective action at the community level to do this kind of monitoring and increasing awareness about what happens to resources when these kinds of technologies expand. So we just have to be very careful as we roll these out in the planning and, and implementation to make sure that we're, we're keeping an eye on what happens to these kinds of resources. Um, I'll go back to the audience now for some questions here in the front. Hi, my name is uh, Joshua. I'm a student at the University of Missouri, and uh, my question has to do with uh, South Africa that you mentioned. They've been experiencing uh, a wave of power outages that's seriously affecting. Sorry. Oh. That's seriously affecting their growth and their growth potential into the future. And I'm wondering, with the cost of storing uh, the energy from renewables. I'm wondering how um, they can sort of overcome this challenge and uh, have sustainable growth while still integrating uh, these new technologies. Right here in the red jacket. Hello. Good morning and thank you for being here. My name is Julian Kyle Lewis from the illustrious Howard University here in Washington. Um, the world is aware of the um, enormous potential that electromagnetism of the entire planet has on being able to offer support to people who don't have it, the 800, 900 million people without electricity that you mentioned. And we're aware of the presence of a device that's rel relatively cheap and affordable that you can like stick into the ground like a staff and it charges the actual device that would provide a lamp 24 hours a day and it would cost about $5. So my question to you is, um, how do you see the entire world benefiting from those additional 800 to 900 million people who don't have access to electricity being able to have a lamp 24-7 for $5? Thank you. All right, I'll go back to the panel, and this will be our, our last round of questions. So if there's one more burning question, we'll take it here in the corner. Um, hi, my question is for Manish Bhakna. Um, at one point in your presentation, you were discussing the relative cost of coal and renewable sources of energy, and you factored in the cost of air pollution and CO2 emissions. Uh, so I'm just curious, how did you calculate the cost of air pollution? Okay. So, so I, I love the question on, on South Africa. So. Um, if you go back, you know, uh, uh, to 2000, 2002, right, in Africa, and you said, oh, 
the continent's going to grow, and we're going to need electricity supply. And we've got to start building coal-fired power plants or big power plants right now, or else we're going to brown out in you know, 2008, 2009, because we're not going to have enough power. Everybody went, ha, 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 ha. The economy hasn't grown. You know, they, we haven't had really gr any growth in two decades. You know, why would we go and, and build all these, all these power plants? Well, and then the economy did grow, and then they all slammed into these um, same, those, those constraints, right? So you have the, the Africa infrastructure country diagnostic coming in right at that time and diagnosing this massive shortage of power and a need to build, build power stations. South Africa did almost exactly uh, that. And, uh, you know, they ran in, they were browning out uh, around, well, just after the World Cup. Uh, they managed to keep things going. Uh, and then, and then, they, then they needed all of a sudden to, to bring in new power. And uh, at the time, they brought in, you know, coal-fired uh, uh, plants. And uh, there, there's a couple of big problems. First of all, th those plants, if they were operating properly, would generate too much power because efficiency has been much more rapid than was expected. So they overinvested to begin with, gained modularity one. Two, they don't work. The power plants don't work. That's why they're browning out. If they, if they were running at more than 50% capacity, there wouldn't be any brownouts. But they don't actually work. Gain two to modularity. If you buy a panel and it doesn't work, you just give it back and you go get a new one. If you have to buy a nuclear power plant and it doesn't work, it's a problem. Uh, and, and so it's th these are, this is uh, gains that I don't think, and this is, you know, a really, really substantial amount of investment by the public sector in South Africa. These are, in substantial measure, South African pension funds sitting in power plants, right? Public pension funds. Uh, and so this, you know, this is real stuff for the, the, the finance of, of people uh, in South Africa. And that kind of, you know, integer problem, to put it technically, um, is, 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 is a real issue, and we haven't really talked about it. And it relates to the debt issues that we're dealing with in Africa and, and so forth, and, I, and it hasn't been factored in as a, as, a, as a potential gain in an environment where you really don't know what's going to happen uh, a long way uh, down, down the road. Um, I think, you know, having, so I think one of the interesting things if you the survey in Ma Myanmar, uh, you know, just a few years ago, um, you know, lots of rural villages were basically in the dark. They didn't, they, are, they had very, and then now, uh, I can't remember the shares exactly, almost nobody had a, a, a solar lantern, and now more than a third of rural households do, only two, three years later. So there is this, this possibility um, uh, of, of that kind of uh, stuff going out. And it is good, I mean, if you don't have a lamp and then you do, that's, that's good. Um, but I think we want to be much more ambitious. We want them to have a lot more to power development. And, uh, and this is where we really uh, need to, to do some, some, some more uh, thinking. So I think that the last one was for you. <coughs> Great, um, thanks, Channing. Just, just four very, very quick points. Um, on, on the points about uh, agriculture, water, forests, um, this nexus question, I, I, I just want to kind of recall that one of the most important contributions that the Sustainable Development Goals did was to kind of bring together these issues and have force us to think about them in a more integrated way and to think both about the synergies but also the trade-offs between trying to achieve those different types of objectives. And so just, just a reflection and a kind of a recognition a little bit about some of the, some of the phenomenal work around the SDGs. Um, on, on your energy access question, um, so I, I, I think clearly um, there is a moral, much less a economic case that can be made about ensuring that the 840 million people that don't have access to electricity do, but I would argue that more than just lighting a bulb, one of the big things that we've seen over the past 10 years is a recognition that a connection isn't sufficient. It isn't sufficient just to light a bulb. The World Bank has this multi-tier framework, tier one through tier five, that talks about different levels of um, quality and reliability of electricity or energy supply. That is where we should be moving toward. So it's not just about having a connection, it's about having sufficient, reliable power to for basic household and productive use 
in a, in a particular place. And we just, just want us to continue to push that as the ultimate objective where we need to achieve not just a connection, which I suspect you would agree with 100%. Um, third, real quick point about air pollution, uh, Indonesia, and how we calculated that. Just very simply, uh, the WHO, many others, do studies that help us develop the relationship between air pollution and mortality and morbidity. So what are the impacts it has on human health? And then, um, and then our economics friends um, put a price on life <laughs> and, and, and disability. Well, we have an acronym for it. <laughs> So the statistical value of a life, there, is, there, is, there are fairly well-established ways in which to then translate the impact on human health into dollar terms, recognizing that is a, at times, quite sensitive uh, translation, but it's an important one to be able to actually capture the economic costs associated with some of these things that don't take away from clearly the moral costs. Fourth uh, point, I just wanted to Thank Channing for the plug for the Global Commission on Adaptation. It is, it is a big deal. It's going to have a big report. It's going to come out on September 10th, two weeks before the UNSG's Climate Summit. Um, a bigger technical report will be coming out in December at the Climate COP. Uh, the World Resources Institute and the Global Center on Adaptation are leading this effort, which involves about 30 commissioners, but if is playing a central role, particularly around a lot of the food and agriculture-related issues. Last final comment, um, what, what I think was quite important, and the reason I in part referred to Jimmy Carter, who, who I adore at one level, but we all recognize there were certain things he didn't quite get right, that speech that he gave on the roof of the White House 40 years ago um, was one of um, scarcity and sacrifice. And I think that was we, a mistake because I think the narrative around renewables is one about clean air, about quality of life, about democratic energy, about jobs, about growth, and, and also about climate, right? But, but the narrative around renewables is a very positive narrative. And that's in part what we need to do to get the political commitment that Channing correctly identified in order to get where we need that transition and ultimately to catch that bus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Channing, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share with us? Okay. Well, that I want to just. I'm sorry. I just want to thank you all then for joining us for this very lively discussion today. Um, it's clear that energy systems are transforming very rapidly and the research now needs to catch up because as Channing pointed out in his slides, there are a lot of questions that remain. And so I hope that we can get together in another five years and talk about what surprised us and how things are going and hopefully we're heading in the very positive and optimistic uh, direction that was talked about today. So thank you all very much and I look forward to seeing you at the next IFPRI event. Thank you.